many of you have uh, grown up or been involved in Pathfinders? How many of you have been involved in Pathfinders? A few hands, but not too many. <laughs> it's a bit like Scouts, but um, the church runs one called Pathfinders. So you go camping and you get honours. <clears throat> yeah. So Pathfinders. I was going to ask too, how many of you, you may not have been involved in Pathfinders, but you may have played this game. How many of you have played the game Capture the Flag? Got a few more hands. So if you've never heard of this game, basically there's two teams, you both have a flag, and you've got to protect it. You've got to guard it. And you've got to prevent people from stealing it. So the idea is when you touch them, they uh, are captured, the enemy, if you like the other team, and they go to jail. And so it's quite a fun game, guarding your flag. From um, Sounds great, Warren, we'll have to do it for you. <laughs> well, um, today I want to talk to you about guarding, guarding the good deposit, guard the good deposit. And uh, just before I go into that, I'm just going to say a word of prayer as well. So, Dear God, just thank you so much for a beautiful church family. Thank you for being with us. I just pray for your Holy Spirit to speak through me, that yeah, you may make clear um, your words and not mine. And God, I just pray that we can all just learn and grow together. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So guard the good deposit. <clears throat> King Herod, he um, had taken in some of the believers from the church and had put them in prison. James, the brother of John, had been killed by King Herod by the sword. And King Herod noticed that the Jews enjoyed this persecution. And as a result, he went and got Peter as well. He put him in prison. It was a festive week leading up to Passover, so he put him in prison until Passover. Then he was planning to put him on trial. But in the meantime, he had him under four, lots of four soldiers, four squads of four. Which, if my maths is right, I was terrible at maths, but I think it's 16. Warren. <laughs> 16, I think. Okay, so 16. So imagine one man who is guarded by 16 soldiers. And two of them are chained to him. You've got two soldiers literally chained to you. And you're in prison and there's another, that means there's 14, guarding outside and everywhere else. That's a safe prison. Apart from the chains and the gates, and there's also these soldiers with swords, like this man here. They know how to kill you. For one man. For one man. That's what it said. Yeah, four lots of four squads, so 16. He was that big a threat to Herod. Well, Herod, Herod wanted to, um, he saw that the Jews were quite happy when he killed James and so this was going to be Peter's fate but in the night and some of you might remember the story a light shone in the prison cell and an angel was there touched him on the side told him to wake up told him to put on his clothes and to get ready his sandals as well put his cloak around him and to follow the angel and that's exactly what he did apparently it was just so much like a dream that it just all happened. He just followed this being. The gate just automatically opened. Also, the chains had fallen off because of the angel. And he just walked outside until he was down the street. And I suppose the nice fresh air. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, what he thought was like a dream. It was like a reality. He was free. He was free. The next day, King Herod, he cross-examined those soldiers. Imagine being one of those soldiers, being cross-examined. Unbelievable. And they were executed. So 16 soldiers were executed. Peter was taken, was saved, and we know that the church was praying for him because when he got to the door of the house, he was knocking on it. The girl that answered the door was so excited to see him that she left the door locked. And went back upstairs. <laughs> it must have been an interesting moment for Peter. He's like, I've just escaped prison and they won't even let me inside. Like, I'm going to get captured again. 
Anyway, he told them to be quiet when they came back and they let him in and he soon moved on. But incredible miracle. And the church were praying for him to be released. Otherwise, he would have met the same fate as James that following after the Passover. But I just want you to think about how Peter was guarded. He was guarded from him escaping and he was also from, guarded from others that might come to take him out. So just keep that in mind as we, um, we move forward. I had a picture there for you. So yeah, an amazing experience for Peter, this bright light and moving through those 16 soldiers. Come with me to 2 Timothy. And we're going to go to 1 chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 7 to 14. So 2 Timothy, after 1 Timothy, that was a bit cheeky, wasn't it? Thessalonians, Timothy, and I'm going to read 2 Timothy 1, 7 to 14. And this, I love how this part starts. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Verse 10. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I will appoint a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I am convinced <clears throat> that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now, depending on your translation, you may not have seen the word guard. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's also translated as keep. So you'll probably see that word there in some of the translations. So in particular, I want to focus on verse 14. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So, I might have to ask Dimmy. Can you read this one for us, Dimmy? <coughs> Very good. Well, that's all. Kind of reminds me of falafel, but it's got nothing to do with falafel. <laughs> falafel. So, to guard, to keep, to watch. Here we are here. Primarily denotes guarding, but can also indicate keeping commandments. And I was just interested, yeah, when I had a look at the SDA Bible commentary, it just made the point that, yeah, the good thing, the key, the entire clause reads, literally, guard the excellent deposit. And so there's this question of, what is he talking about? What are we, what are we guarding? What is this deposit? And so when we, when we read what we've just read from verse 7, you'll see highlighted a few times the emphasis on the gospel. The gospel is highlighted. Henceforth, there were to be custodians. This is um, Paul himself also talking to now Timothy, young Timothy. Custodians of this priceless treasure of the gospel and in truth to pass it on faithfully, faithfully to other guardians. 
It makes me smile when I hear that word guardian. Uh, a friend of mine just recently just said he went and watched, you might have seen a uh, big sign up around the place, Guardians of the Galaxy, there's another movie out. And, um, and I just thought about this in a spiritual way, that there's actually a spiritual truth here. Because essentially, Paul is telling Timothy he is to guard the gospel. And when you think about it, as human beings, as Christians... We are the only ones in the galaxy or the universe required to guard the gospel. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty exciting privilege to be a guardian of the gospel, to guard it, to protect it. Now, just reflecting back on that story of the guards, the sentinels that were standing outside the, the prison for Peter and all those other soldiers... I mentioned there's two things that are happening. The soldiers guarding from him escaping, guarding from others coming in to break him free. So there's kind of like an outward threat and also an inward would threat. And I think spiritually, this can be the same for us as human beings. So when we're guarding the gospel, I just want to reflect on two, two thoughts. We're guarding from something that can happen inside our minds and we're guarding from something that can happen externally. So in a spiritual sense. So let me just bring up a text. It comes from James 1, 5 to 8. And it reads here, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. That's quite heavy language, isn't it? And especially heavy when you think, wait a minute, I've been there. That has happened to me. I noticed in Jude 1.22, Jude says, Be merciful to those who doubt. I think that's good counsel because I think we are susceptible to doubt. And this is what I believe is this first element, what we need to guard against in regards to guarding the gospel, and that is doubt about who God is and what he's done for us. As we, can see, whoops, as we can see in this um, text, we um, can find ourselves thrown all over the place, a description like a sea. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many of you have gone into rough surf and been tumbled around like a washing machine cycle, but it's not a nice feeling. But man, when you break the surface and breathe that fresh air, <laughs> it is awesome. And I think it's the same feeling when you stop doubting. It's like a, refresh, a refreshing grace that fills you. But there's this warning that uh, James gives that when we are in this place of doubt, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. This is in regards to when you request something from God. But I believe it applies very much to the whole gospel because this is something that God has done for us. Now, I just want to read something to you from uh, Selected Messages. Uh, she writes, When we comply with the written word, according to our best knowledge, then we are to walk by faith. Whether we feel any special gratification or not, we dishonour God when we show we do not trust him after he has given us such wondrous evidences of his great love in giving his only begotten son, Jesus, to die, our sacrifice, that we may believe in him, rest our hopes in him, and trust in his word without a question or doubt. Wow. So this emphasis on trusting, and I like how she writes here in regards to what God has done for us. His love, Jesus, the begotten son, to die for us as a sacrifice. The gospel. I also want to read another message there from her which says, Watch as faithfully as did Abraham 
Lest the ravens or the birds, or any birds of prey, alight upon your sacrifice and offering to God. Every thought of doubt should be so guarded that it will not see the light of day by utterance. Light always flees from words which honour the powers of darkness. The life of our risen Lord should be daily manifested in us. So there's this guarding. Um, Every thought of doubt should be so guarded that it is not to see the light of day, to be uttered. So think about this for a minute. You have a doubt. (laughs) It's in your mind. And what we're reading here is, don't let it out. (laughs) Don't let it take over your whole being of, yeah, what God is desiring for you. Because God is truth. And when we doubt that, we um, soon turn into this washing back and forwards in the sea. I'm reminded of the... um, the story, the situation where Jesus is presenting himself before the disciples, but Thomas misses out. And so we have this concept, this phrase, doubting Thomas, because he wasn't there. I know, I think we all relate to him. Just like I said before, that's why I think it's so important what Jude said, to be merciful to those who doubt. Yeah. So we know that Thomas doubted, and it wasn't until he got to touch Jesus for himself, then he believed. Then he believed. It reminded me, actually, when I was back in Avondale, a fellow student came to me one day and he he looked really down and uh, depressed and um, he said he doubted God because he didn't feel God. He doubted God because he didn't feel God. We We won't always feel God. Probably most of the time, we're not always, we're not asked to expect something miraculous. We may not get set free like that in miraculous way that Peter did. It may or may not happen, but it's not so much, the, it's not the feeling, it's what we know to be true. It's having that faith in God. The faith in God. You know, I gave, <laughs> gave this analogy in, in one of the um, universities this, this week. And it's the concept of you're walking on a wall. You know, probably when you're a bit younger, when I was a bit younger too, um, you used to walk on a wall and it's sort of quite narrow and it's fairly high, it's a bit of fun. It's narrow and you're balancing. And while you're looking forward, it, it makes it quite easy. But when you look back, you get a bit wobbly and you can more likely fall off. And the analogy goes like this, that when we're looking forward, we're looking forward to God, his word, the truth. But when we turn around... We're looking back at more how things might feel or what other people are saying. So, word of God in front. The word of God. Be merciful to those who doubt. Actually, just even more recently, a friend of mine I haven't spoken to for a while, grew up with him, and um, he just opened up all of a sudden in a message and just said he'd been doubting for several years, doubting God. And I know he has a strong faith. So it was a surprise to me when I heard that he said that he was doubting God. And the reason behind his doubting was that he's, he's like me, he's the same age as me, a little bit older, but we both turned 40 this year. And um, in his mind, he believed that God would have provided wife, family, kids. That was what he envisaged when he... Following God, these things would would happen, but it hasn't happened. And so sometimes when we don't see things happen, we doubt. Does that make sense? You see other friends and people doing things at a certain time and age, but why isn't it happening for you? Why isn't it happening for you? So he had doubts, but I was so grateful to hear that he was moving out of that place and trusting God with his life. No matter what. Whether he ends up getting married or having kids, that's not really the point. It's keeping the focus on God, on Jesus. And so I was encouraged by that. So I believe that's one avenue where the devil can really attack is that we doubt. 
And in particular, we doubt that God can even forgive us. Or maybe we've done it too many times. It's, the devil says that's enough. You've, you've pushed it too far. But that's not the gospel. It's not the truth. God's door is always open to us. He is faithful, even when we are unfaithful. So the other, the other door, or the other example, that was inside. So we have doubt. And then there's outside. So in the literal prison, it was those coming to maybe set Peter free. But who might be coming maybe spiritually to turn us that we need to guard ourselves? Let me just go to a text. And this is in 1 Timothy, and it's um, 6, 20 and 21. So it reads here, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you. So here is a particular, I suppose, insight into something that's happening and causing people to lose faith, uh, wandering away from faith. We have this, um, I suppose it's, it happens a lot, godless chatter. We can find ourselves surrounded, uh, work, a school environment, where we can be sucked into this kind of um, talk. And then there's this concept of falsely called knowledge. Just looking at a commentary, SDA commentary, it uh, just says, it is generally believed that Paul here alludes to teachings of the kind later set forth in a more fully developed form by the Gnostics. So we have this understanding of knowledge or science. And I just want to read to you Gnosticism. It was interesting that a particular early, early father, I suppose, um, Irenaeus, around 125-202 AD, he was the bishop um, in Gaul, Lundanum in Gaul, so which is now, if I'm pronouncing it right, Lyons or Lyons, Lyons. Who's, who's, who can speak French? <laughs> is it Lyons? Lyon. Lyon. Lyon, France. Thank you. Thank you. I need to travel more. And so <laughs> Arrhenius was born in Smyrna, so one of the seven churches in Revelation. And um, he studied under the bishop Polycarp, who is believed apparently to have done some discipleship under Apostle John. Does that sound right, Byron? Yeah, that's, when I read that, I thought, how awesome is that? So we've got the Apostle John, we've got Polycarp, and then you've got Arrhenius. And he's the one who stood up to this particular heresy, if you like. And I just thought I'd share a little bit about this heresy of knowledge. What's so wrong with knowledge? It's good to learn. We know that's biblical as well, to study. But Solomon says don't study too much or it might make you sick. <laughs> I used to quote that to my parents when I was studying. Sorry, students, you probably shouldn't hear that. So um, Gnosticism is a heresy which made it, uh, made up of a diverse set of beliefs. It is the teaching based on the idea of basically secret knowledge or knowledge of transcendence arriving at or by of eternal intuitive means. While Gnosticism thus relies on personal religious experience and as its primary authority, early Christian Gnostics uh, did adopt their own versions and authority of scriptures such as found in, at the Nag Hammadi in Egypt. So there's actual, um, if you like, Gnostic gospels to like Mary and Philip, etc., which aren't the true gospels. Um, so what we know, Arrhenius, because he was so thorough, and uh, it makes sense if he's come under this sort of leadership, he would be looking out, guarding against... What would be false in regards to the gospel? And just to give you some general beliefs that came out of this knowledge philosophy, if you like, um, they believe that matter, whether it be physical, universe, or the human body, is evil. It is obvious that there is a great tension between spirit and matter. This affects many of their beliefs and especially the way they perceive the world and God's in interacts with it. 
So God, God is wholly transcendent. That is, he is far removed from his creation. He did not create the material universe because it was um, instead created by an evil or lesser God. Interesting. God is thus too perfect and pure to have much to do with the evilness of the material universe. Humanity. Gnostics believe that human beings were sparks or droplets of the very same spiritual substance or essence that God is. Somehow we, we become trapped in our physical bodies from which we are to escape. And now salvation. Gnosticism commonly held that salvation is to escape from the bondage of the material existence and travel back to the home from which soul spirits have fallen. God initiates salvation because he wants to draw back the, the stray bits and pieces of himself. So you can sort of get little flickers of truth through these statements. And so he sends forth an emanation of himself, a spiritual redeemer who comes down from heaven and gives an attempt to t teach some of the divine sparks of spirit what their true identity is and where their real home lies. Once they are awakened by this redeemer, they can then begin their journey back home. Salvation is by knowledge, self-knowledge. Salvation is by knowledge. Is that the gospel? <clears throat> Jesus, just in regards to his incarnation. Jesus, lastly, as far as most scholars know, Gnostics consider themselves Christians and say Jesus as a heavenly messenger. However, they rejected the idea of God becoming incarnate, God becoming man. Remember what I read earlier? Everything is evil. Everything is evil. God becoming incarnate, God becoming man, dying and rising, rising body. These beliefs were considered unspiritual and against true wisdom because they entangled spirit with matter. So here we have an interesting situation where we have Jesus coming, incarnate in flesh is a problem <laughs> because he's meant to be separate. He's not allowed to be this intimate God that can come and give up his life for us. And so we have this false gospel of knowledge which is mentioned here, scholars believe, right there. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. Knowledge cannot save you. It's a different meaning to understand that we have a knowledge in what the Bible tells us but it doesn't save us. That's something that God does. Saved by grace through faith. It's God's act. God has to be the one who saves us. That's why he had to die on the cross. That's why he had to die on the cross. I want us to go, come in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses one this is partway through Paul's charge to Timothy, so I'm just taking it from halfway through. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 8. In the presence of God and of the Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to, set, to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all have longed for his appearing. So an awesome charge to Timothy. Paul, it's not long before he's to die. 
And we know that he was killed um, by the Romans. He um, believed to be beheaded. So not a, not a nice ending to his life, but he had such incredible faith all the way through. And he gave this, if you like, charge and handed it over to Timothy, who in also likewise would hand it over to others under him. And you know what? It's not just someone that's mentioned in the Bible, but it's for all of us believers. We are entrusted with the gospel to protect it, to guard it. And I think that's um, it's exciting because the gospel is so beautiful and powerful. Let me just remind you of the true gospel. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. Isaiah. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. Mark. So... God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name, Paul. Through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could you could not to be justified from by the law of Moses. Paul again. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Paul. But God demonstrates his own love for us. In this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul again. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. By this gospel, you have been saved. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's trespasses, trespasses against him. Paul again. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is the gospel. Paul again. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our Saviour, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on his, us richly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Titus, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people and will appear a second time, not to bear sin but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Paul. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his, his wounds you have been healed, Peter. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God, Peter. And then finally, John, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And this is just touching on what the gospel truly is. It's a gift from God. And unfortunately, as human beings, we can mess up that gift. And that's why we need to guard it. Guard the gospel. Just like Paul charged Timothy, I charge you and myself... <laughs> to keep the gospel true, that it may continue to bring hope and life for eternity, for eternity. I'm going to ask. Dear God, thank you so much that we can just come and worship you. It's so, such an awesome thing to do every week. And I just want to thank you. And I want to pray that you give us strength to not doubt. Help us to fully trust you. Help us to build build and build um, that faith in you 
and I know it all happens in experiences and just um, seeing you, you work. But sometimes, God, we just don't feel or see things um, that we might expect. So I just pray, God, that you'll protect us, help us to guard, that we can trust that what you've done on the cross is sufficient, that you have saved us, that you do forgive us, and that we do have eternal life to come, beginning right now. And thank you, Jesus, that you did come in the flesh and walk this earth over 2,000 years ago for your mission and for your mission of love to set us all free, God. So I pray for your protection of the doubts that come to our minds. I pray too for the outward influences that try to take us away from the pure gospel, how refreshing it is because it's, it's you. You laid down your son, Jesus Christ, for us. We didn't do that. And so thank you, Jesus, for setting your life and giving it up as a ransom for every single one of us. May we go out with joy in our steps and in our spirit as we speak and act. May we just take that joy into this coming week. In your name, Jesus. And I pray and thank you for those that have prepared food for us to eat. Thank you that we can enjoy it together. And thank you for giving it to us. In your name, Jesus. Amen.